Um, I just want to thank hello to everyone that, that has joined this afternoon. We really appreciate you joining over your lunch break. We are really looking forward to um, hearing a little bit more this afternoon around the digitalization of DC Thompson Media from Richard, who's head of newspapers. And hopefully it will give everyone some further insight into some team changes there and also just give a, an opportunity to ask any questions that you, you may have about the changes or, or ways to pitch stories. So um, yeah, thanks again. And Richard, I'll, I'll give it over to you. Okay, thank you. I shall just try and share this. You should see a presentation from me, I think. Uh, you see that? Yeah, I hope. Yeah, all clear. Yeah, okay. it's good. It's just in the um, PowerPoint, though, rather than full screen. All right, how do I get it full screen? Is it that thing there I press? Slideshow. That should be it, yeah, put at the top, and then it'll say, I should say present. Is that it? Is that better? That's it, Bab. Okay, right. So, um, yeah, I've been speaking to Hannah about um, trying to update you all a bit more on um, what we call Program Apollo, which is um, uh, our way of, of transforming our business for the future. Um, what it's all about is, um, in its simplest form, what we're trying to do is to transform our news brands from being print-centric to uh, digital first um, operation, which is a very short sentence, but it's a huge piece of work in terms of what we need to do for that. I mean, obviously, historically, uh, print news brands have been declining steadily for more than 30 years now. And despite being very effective ways of communicating very effective and very strong brands, we have, as like all newspapers, we've been losing space in the digital uh, area in terms of revenue raising space. So we've always had great digital audiences, but we haven't really been able to raise um, uh, revenue in the same way digitally as we can in print. So our aim we set out two years was to find a way in which we could um, monetize our digital audience. And very quickly, we came to the conclusion that um, simply going for scale, simply making ourselves as big as we possibly could in the hope of selling advertising revenue or getting advertising revenue in the back of that was not going to work. And that's the model that's largely been adopted until very recently by pretty much every UK publisher has adopted that model. And we quickly realized that actually that wasn't going to work for us and particularly it wasn't going to work in the regional news space. So we spent about 18 months going around the world looking everywhere apart from Britain to try and find a, um, a if anybody was doing any kind of work that would help solve this problem. And we found out very quickly that people in America um, and Scandinavia and Northern Europe were really making great strides in this area. So this is where our model has come from. And in its sort of, at its very essence is, you know, again, another on the face of it, rather glib sentence, but one that really matters is serving content to audiences and how they want it and when they want it, which of course, lots of news brands in Britain claim to do that, but Actually, what they do is they serve the content they've got to audiences in the only way they know how, um, really, as opposed to actually serving audiences with what they want when they want it. And the other sort of bedrock of the Apollo thing is that we realised that the only way in which we can get people to pay for content, which is our only long-term um, solution for our news brands, is by making that content as good as it possibly can be. So make, making the content superb, the experience of getting that content perfect and also making that content unmissable um, and we're doing that by sort of connecting with specific audiences through dynamic and impactful um, storytelling and I'll come on to talk a little bit more about that in a second but the other bit of Apollo is non-digital so it's not really about using digital products and digital communications it's about the role our brands play in our communities and what we've realized is that to have a loyal paying subscriber base, whether that's a subscriber base in print or a subscriber base digitally, we think we have to play a more meaningful part in the lives of people in our communities. Now, every single newspaper in Britain says we're at the heart of our community and we like, we're championing our community, we're, we do this, we do that. The, the reality is they probably don't. What they do is they report on their communities and they report on the feelings of their communities, but they don't actually get under the skin of the communities and do what their communities want them to do. So that's about being really proper scrutineers of life and 
scrutineers of the things that impact your communities, being you know, championing communities in a way that is more than just um, highlighting, you know, good stories and, and, and you know, good deeds. It's about being the facilitators of change by being lobbyists, by being um, uh, conveners and pulling together parties and interested people together um, to make things happen locally and um, to do things that never make it into print or never make it in, uh, on, on, online simply because they're good for the community. And by doing all that kind of activity, we then, uh, um, our, our, our audiences become, or we become part of our community and that community becomes fans of what we do and they then become part of our audience. To tell you a little bit about how we've done it, we've transformed our newsroom to be what is called a mini publisher team model. So if you think about the way print works, we have a whole lot of reporters backed up by production journalists and photographers and whatnot designed to gather as much information as we can and to collect it all on a single print product and put it out into the marketplace and hoping that the public like what they read. And because of the nature of print, the feedback from the performance of that print product will come in a few days later, maybe a week later, which you'll find out whether that day's efforts really worked or not. And that you would iterate and change your content to suit your audiences based on the information you're getting over a course of weeks, months. In the mini publisher team model, we're using data, um, audience data, so that's audience activity data, audience performance data to identify not just um, who's consuming content, when and how, but also what content they want to consume. So we did a huge exercise where we, we went out and we, and we surveyed readers and we said, what areas are you interested in? And what things do you want to read about? What matters to you in your life? And we, from that, we devised a range of about 20 odd subject areas. Um, and what we do is we have arranged our entire newsroom around these um, subject areas. So we have small teams who are dedicated to um, uh, engaging with readers who are interested in specific content areas. So a reporter these days is attached to a specific team. So you could be a food and drink reporter or a transport reporter, or a crime reporter, sports reporter, or um, any number of, of different teams. And the key point is that these teams are empowered to do whatever it takes to engage with their audience. So they can not just create content, but they can create events. They can create one-off publications. They can create, um, uh, um, as I said, they can create events, a whole manner of events. It could be face-to-face um, -face events, online events. It could be social events. It could be educational events. Um, it could be, um, uh, you could create um, clubs of readers who want to share and exchange ideas. But the idea is that you empower the journalist teams to work, um, to do whatever it is necessary to get the engagement with um, the um, the environment community or the schools community or the health community to get them to, un, to, to engage with our content and thereby to become uh, subscribers. To do this, we've joined our morning and evening titles together so we no longer have separate newsrooms for the Courier and the Telegraph in Dundee or the PJ and the Express in Aberdeen. We have single newsrooms and the, the, the teams work. They don't work across, some of the teams work across the geography. So some teams work across both Aberdeen and Dundee, um, but, the, but the teams, all the Dundee teams work for both titles in Dundee and all the Aberdeen teams work for both titles in Aberdeen. To make these, to help these teams do their job, we've also created an insights and data and audience team to serve the newsroom um, with the kind of analysis they need to understand what the audience is doing. So we get immediate feedback on, on obviously the performance of content now um, but also we get longer term trends analysis, we get and um, we do insight uh, research into audience needs and audience wants. Um, and we also uh, uh, have a, a team specifically geared towards expanding the size of the potential audience as well. And then we also have a, a new audience management team and they're the ones who drive the acquisition and retention, engagement and retention of subscribers through the sales funnel, which I'm sure all of you will be very familiar with. And the final change in the newsroom really has been the creation of a new product team, which is to manage our digital products to deliver this great user experience I was talking about. Now, previously, anybody who's worked in newsrooms before would realize that digital, digital teams, digital technical teams were people who worked two floors above or below and you never really had any kind of, um, uh, um, any kind of 
dealings with, probably with good reason, um, who looked after your products um, in a way that really wasn't tied into the journalistic or the audience needs. But our product team brings that function right into the newsrooms and all these new teams, data and audience, audience management, product team are all part and partial of our new um, our new newsrooms. And, and, it, and, and, and the, the way it works is very simple, is that we, we no longer have um, pinch points and funnels through which all content runs. So there's no news desk, there's no business desk, there's no um, sports desk as such. There are teams in these content areas and they drive all engagement through content. And then the new skills that I've spoken about that have been introduced to the newsroom, social, search engine optimization, social teams, uh, data, audio, visual, and skills come in behind the content that these teams produce and enhance that content and improve it and optimize it for digital consumption. The AV team in particular um, has been a big investment by our by us. I mean, most newspapers in Britain or news brands in Britain have long since stopped having photographers or um, any kind of picture desk. And we've just increased so across, across our four titles, we've now got um, an AV team of you know, more than 30 people who are dedicated towards creating not just stills photography, but uh, video, um, extensive video capability, plus um, things like animation and all that sort of stuff that comes into audio visual. They're also responsible for expanding the audio side of it. So they're looking after an increasing suite of podcast products um, all through one team. And the upshot of this for print is that print is now done later in the day but done better. I mean, traditionally, and still in most newspapers, the print product is done and then the digital product is reversed out of the print product. Well, we are doing it the other way around. But because the content is being served to audiences when they want it, it is being served 24 hours a day. And when we choose, when we come to do print, we're getting the absolute latest piece of content from any one of our teams. And it is fully optimized digitally, which means that it has all the particular bells and whistles in terms of storytelling that are also transferable to a large degree into print. So we've redesigned the print products to make that process easier and leaner. But what it means is the quality of content by the time it gets to print is even better. And we kind of thought, like many publishers do, well, if you're doing it before the print deadline with all the bells and whistles and making it much better, surely your digital um, performance will mean people will drift away from print and it simply hasn't happened and when you look around the world um, where this model has been adopted before the print audiences remain uh, because it's just about a way of consuming the content for some people print is just the way they want to do it and for others it's not and the two are not interchangeable so much really and um, people understand that when they're um, engaging with content from a print point of view they're engaging in a different kind of experience rather than a digital one so for us, print is done later, but better. Now this is a, this is a view of the newsroom, um, if you like. It kind of, I hope you can see it. I don't know, I hope nobody's watching on a mobile phone, but um, this is basically the mini publisher team uh, is at the center of the newsroom. So these are all the teams we've got, joint teams of politics, food and drink, nostalgia, comment, victories, and impact, which is long form investigative storytelling, which we've done some pretty amazing stuff on over the last six months. And then in Aberdeen, these are the teams, live news, sport, entertainment, transport, business, health and wellbeing, schools, family, crime and courts, a team specifically for Aberdeen City and a team specifically for Inverness and the Highlands. Dundee is largely the same list of, of teams um, with the um, addition of a community team, which is largely the same as the city and north. So all of these are individual teams. Um, we've taken on um, about 30 new journalists to um, populate these teams, but also to populate all these um, uh, functions around the outside of the newsroom. So these are all the additional functions I've talked about, the AV desk at the top, um, uh, audience management, this is just the editor area of the two um, uh, estates. A print content team, print production team. We have data and insights and product here and content development and skills and innovation. So this is what we call our donut. So the stuff around the outside of the donut is all geared towards helping the people in the middle of the donut produce the content that will engage the audiences and encourage people to subscribe. This is in slightly more detail. Um, and I'll maybe send this to Hannah 
after the presentation, it shows the Dundee MPTs, the Aberdeen MPTs and the joint MPTs. It's just got the numbers of in, in each team, but also who the team leads are and people you might want to contact um, depending on the, the, the content area you're talking about. And I suppose from, from a sort of PR point of view, the, the, this idea of us um, uh, targeting specific um, audience is quite crucial to your um, operation as well in the sense that you are using or you do use print um, outlets in a kind of generalist way to put something out to a general audience and, and to see whether it um, you were to hopefully get the return you want on that sort of general activity, which is still useful considering you don't always know where the audience is that you're trying to reach with your content. But in this way, if you because we're targeting specific audi audiences, we're, we're kind of asking you to do the work with us. So if you've got a school story, what we're looking for is engagement with our schools team, and also to have all the sort of digital engagement tools surrounding that story um, ready to go as well. So we're looking for digital storytelling, things like video, um, audio, we're looking at um, uh, um, having, uh, Get, you know, galleries of photos and content optimized for a very specific audience. So we're looking to work with you in terms of creating outlets for that, for that content. Um, in terms of whether or not it's worked, um, the, this is some stats from up until March. So we launched this model in the summer of 2020. So in the first sort of eight, nine months, um, Again, these were the sort of trial teams we did politics in both the states, nostalgia in both the states, and food and drink in both, both the states and schools in the Kura area. And this is a percentage increase. These are old fashioned metrics that you would use like page views and that sort of stuff, but it is an indication of the engagement level, although it's not a very useful indication, but you know, this is the percentage rise. So Kura politics, 913% rise over that 10 month period. Nostalgia, 1,202 percentage rise over that period. So it shows that in audience volume terms, it's definitely worked. But in terms of audience um, engagement, um, we set ourselves a target um, over the next five years of getting to 75,000 subscribers over the five titles, we including the Sunday Post and this, and that's a subscriber to any of our digital products. So that could be the website or the digital replica um, paper. And in the last three weeks alone, we've, um, we're acquiring subscribers at a rate of more than 450 every week. Now that scales up to more than 20,000 new subscribers a year. Now, obviously there's a churn figure in there. So we'll lose you know, anything up to half of them. But anybody who's been, who's been around newspapers for um, any time at all over the past, 10 to 15 years will realize that anything that puts on 450 plus um, paying people every week is an incredible improvement on the situation that we've been in before. So from our point of view, we're well on track to reach our 75,000 subscribers over five years. And I realize that's um, a whistle stop tour, an incredible whistle stop tour um, of uh, the Apollo program from our point of view. Um, but I'm happy to sort of answer questions and um, to uh, take any questions that you like from there. I don't know whether that was too quick or whether that was um, uh, not detailed enough, and I'll, I'll um, be guided by you, but perhaps um, if there's any questions at all, I'll, I'll gladly answer them. No, that was spot on. Thank you so much. Just before we go into questions, Richard, I think there's a couple of people waiting in the waiting room. Can you all grab right. an access? Sorry, it's just that you've jumped to the host. How do I do that? Um, it should, does it say that there's a waiting room? It did, but I think I closed it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, so, it's okay, don't worry about it. Sorry, I should have flagged that before we we have to do the report. Okay. It will be available on catch up so we can send that out to some of the people that were keen to join. Okay, um, sorry, sorry about that. No, don't apologize. I should have cleared that before. Um, I think that was, such a great insight into the changes that have happened over the last you know few months and really insightful to hear how that's been going on in the background over the last couple of years uh, to kick off questions I just had a couple around how we set we pitch stories so is there no longer a, a business desk or what, well, the, you know? 
there is a business team. There's a business so, team, okay. And they would operate in the way that an old-fashioned business desk operates. So, um, uh, and it's the same, actually, well, certainly, um, Rob McLaren runs that team in Dundee, and Eric Askeland actually runs a team in Aberdeen now. So yeah, they, they act very much like a business desk with they are, they are they are a team because that subject area mirrors what the old print operation had. What's perhaps not there anymore, which is different, is there's not a news desk. So um, previously, lots of people would funnel their content or their ideas or their pitches through a news desk. That doesn't really exist. So um, every team has a team leader, and every team has, has it's, a, it's a sort of news desk in in, in miniature, if you like, but. Uh -huh. You're going to have to be. You're going to have to be more specific about what your content's about and where you want to pitch it. So, most of the subject areas that we've got um, uh, would cover most of the areas that, that you would cover. But if you can't find a team for your content, then it suggests that probably, not, probably isn't an audience for that content, um, or certainly not a big audience for that content. So, if it's a story about health, then we have a health team. If it's a story about food and drinks, we, we, we have that. Or entertainment, we've got an entertainment team. Or so there's a sports team, so there's a, there's a, a whole host of teams covering subject areas, but you, we want you to pitch directly to these teams, not into a central news desk. So I suppose what would happen is, is PR pitches would come into a news desk and then the news desk would funnel it out to whichever reporter they thought appropriate or whoever was available or whichever district office or whatever would take it. Now, we, 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 what we're really looking at is, is that content going directly to the people who are experts in that area, really, um, which that should, in, in theory, that should make a relationship with um, particularly specialist PR organisations better. Um, but it should also mean that your content will be treated better and should, and should definitely reach the audience that you want to reach, because we're interested in reaching a specific audience. So we're no longer in the game of just throwing stuff out there and hoping that it sticks. We really, you know, if we've got a story about schools that we think is worth reporting, we want that story to really engage people because if they're really engaged in that content, they'll be more inclined to subscribe to our products. So it's now our interests, if you like, PR, PR interests and the news brand's interests are aligned in, in the sense that, you know, if it's a health story, we want to make sure that it is the most engaging, the most thoughtful and insightful piece of storytelling that we can get. Whereas in print, if you think about it, what, what you got or what we both had to deal with in print is, is if it's a good story, we would um, we would obviously write about it and project as much as we could, but that projection was limited by the space available in print and the number of slots for pictures. So if it was only a page lead space, so it's, you know, 600 words plus one picture, it only got 600 words plus one picture. Whereas that, that same story now may well get that treatment in print, but, it would, but online it will get the space it needs to tell optimally. Now that could be fewer words, strangely enough. Um, it could be more, but it will almost certainly be enhanced in some way with you know, um, more than one picture or with video, with audio, if that's available. And then the upshot of that for print is, yes, print are still dealing with it in the 600 words plus a picture slot, but the quality of the content that's available to print for that slot will be so much better, we hope, because it will have been through the digital process, be optimized for a very specific audience, therefore it can be written better, be, have had all the enhancements it needs to, it needs, it needs, to um, it needs, and then it will um, appear in print with hopefully a better choice of pictures and that sort of stuff. So that's the theory, I think. No, that's really interesting. And just a quick hello to everyone that's that's joined um, the event now. We're just going through a few questions. I see that Grant's put a question in the box, Richard, asking, is the press release dead in the digital age? Um, it depends what you mean by press release. If, if you're talking about um, a simple press release uh, that you fire into a, uh, into a news desk and hope that it makes it into print through catching the eye of the news editor or whatever, then probably it probably is dead, dead, you know, a, a little bit. But if I'm being perfectly frank, if that's all you're relying on to get your content into print in the past, you're probably being a little bit lazy, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think um, there, are, there 
have there has been for quite some time other ways to catch the eye of news operations in terms of making digital assets available for news operations um, uh, by really understanding audiences and, and being able to um, show, demonstrate that you have a knowledge of audiences as well. So the press release isn't dead at all. It's just the information and the way stories need to be told is changing. Um, and I think you need to make your, you have a responsibility as well as us to optimize content, to make sure that it actually reaches the audience that you want to reach. And at, and at, at the end of the day, what you want to be able to do is to feed back to your clients the level of engagement that content got. So the more engaging you can make that content, then the more engagement there'll be. And in, as far as the press release, you know, the, the, the old fashioned single page press release, that um, just needs to be adapted for the digital yeah. age. It needs to be changed, it needs to be, you know, so it needs to be, here's our story, here's what we're pitching, here's what our client's interest in. And by the way, if you want, here are all the various digital assets that go with this story that you can use. We can help you in terms of social media projection. We can, we can do all this sort of stuff and that will catch the eye of these teams. And therefore, so the press release has to become more sophisticated, I suppose is a short answer to, to that question. No, that's great, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Hi, Roger. How are you doing, mate? It's Jamie. Um, Hi. Nice Hi. to see you again. Yeah, you too. Hi. Yeah. Um, it was really just to see from a from our own kind of point of view um, with the SFRS, um, what would you kind of suggest for an emergency service? We're obviously always kind of promoting various various things, whether it's recruitment or um, community community work. Would it be the, the kind of community team would be best to, to tie in with? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of teams that you would tie in with. So obviously there's the live news team. The live Each area has a live news team, which is essentially, to give it an old fashioned name, is breaking news, really. It's the live breaking news, which obviously your team will engage with our live teams on a regular basis, just in the way they always have, Jamie. So it's, that doesn't change. But if you're looking at community safety, community awareness, then there are different ways of looking at it. You know, what's the audience you're trying to reach? Is it, is it a school audience? If it's a school audience, then you're going to engage with the school's team, find a way of telling that story that really engages with that particular audience. Now, the school's audience may, if for us, may differ from you slightly in the sense that we're not necessarily targeting school children with our content. We are targeting families with children at school for that content. So that would be a way of doing it. I think what you have to think about more is... Um, so you have a particular, let's just say it's a fire safety message. You have to really, you now have to really think, who do we want to read this? Because the, the, you know, the days of, of, of saying, well, we just want everybody to read it. Well, that's kind of, you can, A, you can do that yourself through social media. Um, so, you know, if you just want the world to see it, then just, you know, give it some gimmick and throw it out on social media and, You'll, you'll achieve the numbers that you want to achieve. But if you're looking at, if you're looking for a particular audience to engage with your community or, or to engage with your content and your organization um, around a piece of content, so to understand that they truly are reading it and your target audience is engaged, and you have to, you have to identify that audience yourself. So um, I'm trying desperately to think of a particular example from your line of work, but let's say it's um, to do with, um, well, let's think about um, the recent deaths in lochs in Scotland in the, in, in, in the warm weather. In, in, in warm weather now, it's not your responsibility to necessarily do that prevention, but the fire service has been, if I understand it, has been involved in a number of incidents out and about, not just at lochs, but people outside enjoy themselves and things like, um, uh, um, you know, like people leaving barbecues to set things on fire and all that sort of stuff. So what you're looking for is an outdoor audience, an audience that, um, is going to uh, exploit that weather. Well, if I was you, you could, you could then, through your own um, uh, data analysis, try and identify who that audience is. Now, traditionally, you'd, you'd identify it by, by age, really by all the usual factors, by age, um, geography, and that sort of thing. But to think a bit smarter than that, you need to think about, well, this is probably um, something that has to go through... Um, the environment team to get an environment audience around people who care about the destruction that's being done. I can therefore um, take that story on in a lobbying sense or take it on in a social media sense to spread that message. Or you go to the schools and family team because obviously a lot of the, this affects 
um, picnicking families for better or worse. And so you have to start thinking about who who do I really want to engage with? You know, who who do who do we as the fire and rescue service really want to engage with and try and um, uh, identify that audience prior to approaching our teams? Really, I suppose what we're doing is we're kicking a lot of the work back to you. Yeah, in the first instance. that's important though. No, thanks very much. Very interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask Richard, in terms of you know when you were talking quite near the start about the you know, audience um, data and insights team and kind of the work that they do in terms of like you know surveying audiences and the the trends forecasting and things like how much does does that kind of thing impact then the the content that you're putting out in terms of you know, does that affect what stories might be picked up by the team or is that yeah. just no, it does. It it does hugely. I mean, what we're what we really what we really want is to. We have to take it back to basics and look at it from our point of view. The only way we're going to persuade people to part with their money um, to subscribe to us is if they really are interested or they get a lot of value out of the content they're reading, or they are fans of what we do. Um, and that's really what we're trying to get is that we deliver for people specifically what they want. So in terms of the data and insights, the only way, the only two ways that we can really determine what they want is by watching them. So understanding what, how they, what content they consume, how they consume, when they consume it, and asking them. And in the past, the problem with asking them was we didn't know who they were because our relationship was with the news agent, not with the reader. So, the, to the, so we, we sent our pro products into a news agents, and then the news agent had the relationship with the reader rather than us. So we couldn't, we, we, we could go out and knock on doors and try and find them and ask them. But now we have a direct relationship with our readers and we recruit them into panels and we say to them, did you like this story? Did you not like the story? And we take apart, not every story, but we pick individual stories and we, and we take them apart with readers and say, what did you like about this? What didn't you like? What worked for you? What didn't work for you? And that sort of education, self-education and knowledge builds up a much more accurate picture from our point of view as to what people like and, and, and what they don't. And there's a really interesting thing, um, phenomenon around, um, you know, different kinds of content, traditional, you know, newspaper content, um, for example, entertainment and what's on. What we've suddenly realized is that we, we kind of always thought that people, um, turn to newspapers to find out what's on. Well, they do, but they also turn to loads of other sources as well. Mm -hmm. And to compete directly on simply on, on listings, saying that this show is on at this theater at this time, we've kind of lost that space. But what, but, but what our readers do want is they want us to do, to concentrate on things like previews and reviews much more. So we've got, so in the traditional newspaper listings thing, we've sort of changed that to just think we're not going to really do that. And we didn't know that until we asked the audience, until we found out about the audience. So that's happening across all aspects of um, of uh, of our of our our content areas. We did a very interesting thing um, in sport terms. We we, you know, we that we have known that. Um, uh, the majority of people in our area, despite the best efforts of Aberdeen Football Club or, or Dundee or Dundee United, that actually most people in our areas support Rangers or Celtic. And we've known that for a very long time, and therefore we've kind of carried, we've always carried content on Rangers and Celtic as well as our local teams. But the reality is, is our audiences don't want us to do that, or they don't care whether we do it or not. They really want us to concentrate on what only we can do, which is provide really good content on St. John's and Dundee, I mean, that sort of stuff. So we took that a stage further with the, the Highland League, which for those of you not from, not you know, who are in the central belt, you may well be unaware of what the Highland League is, but it's a, it's a level down from, from Scottish League football. And it's a, it's, it's a very grassroots, but popular league featuring teams with bizarre shiny names like Forest Mechanics and all that sort of stuff. But it's a fairly big operation. And what we've done is we've actually we wanted to find a way of engaging with that audience. So we spoke to them and we um, looked at how they were engaging with content. And we decided that actually the best way that we could engage with them was by making a weekly television program. 
So we're a news brand, we're traditionally a print news brand, and we do cover the Highland League in print, but what we, we launched three weeks ago, we launched a Monday night half hour um, catch up program, which we broadcast through our, um, our websites. And it includes, we bought the rights for three games a week, I think, I can't remember. And we have our traditional print sports guys sitting rather uncomfortably in front of the camera talking about the Highland League. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a product in, um, in, 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 in development in the sense that we had to launch it for the start of the season, but it is being refined every week. It's getting better and better. And the audience has turned out to be fantastic, really fantastic, because nobody else is doing this. Nobody else has invested in it. So we're looking for pockets of, of, um, uh, of, of subject area and audience. If you like audience dissatisfaction, where's the audience not satisfied? And that's what we're looking for. And the only way we can identify that is through the use of data. And that's why the data and insights is really absolutely key to what we're doing in the future. That's a really long answer to, to your question, but I hope no, that explains no. it. No, that's brilliant. That's really interesting as well. Um, you know, definitely a very, very agile way of working. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean that's a, that sort of language um, is is banded around a lot these days. And, yeah. But it, but it is, it, I mean, it is an agile way of working. It's, it's you know, and... Um, uh, but it's innovative, really. It's it's yeah. it's trying to to just work that little bit harder mm -hmm. to 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 get to your audiences. And you know, there used to be. I, I did an experiment with um, uh, a charity event. That, so somebody had come to us and said, "We're doing this charity event, and would we put it in the paper?" And I kind of, well, and I, this was before we had launched the. Um, the new setup, but I said to the news desk, well, you know, why are we doing that? And they said, well, because it's a charity event, everyone likes charity events. And I did a survey of our of our titles, and there was like an incredible percentage of our content was around charity events. And um, but when I when I when I searched every charity event that had been in our paper that week, every single one of those charity events had been on Facebook the week before. So everybody who was involved in the event or who was interested in the event had already consumed it on Facebook. What they were getting through print was verification. It was sort of like um, public recognition that they had done their, their charitable deed. But the reality of life when, we, when that transferred into, into digital space was that there wasn't an audience to say, well done. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the digital audience for that content had already consumed it on Facebook. So that then gives the organizers of that charity event a challenge because you know, do they just stick with the Facebook audience, which I would argue would probably be, be a bit limiting, but they now have to find a way to work with us in a more innovative way and in a more timious way so that we get access or so that our audience gets access to that content before it appears in Facebook or in a, in a way different to Facebook, I think. Yeah. I saw a question pop up there. I couldn't quite. Yeah, I think it was from Fabio who's asking whether the magazine will become what the newspaper used to be for the next generation. So, what, where does the future of the magazine line? Is there any plans to incorporate magazines into the DCT publication? You, by magazines, you mean our. Yeah, like pull outs and that. Oh, right. I mean, the magazines are. The magazines are a real integral part of print, obviously, and there is a there is a there's a really really strong audience for consuming the magazines that come with our titles and and, on the, and they come out mostly on a Saturday, and we're investing in that side of the in the sense that we are continuing to, to to have print dedicated features teams to supply these magazines because there is a really strong audience out there who want to sit down at a leisurely pace over the weekend reading our magazines. So they have a very, very strong future. Um, the, 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 you know, it's a Career Weekend magazine and the Your Life with P&J and that sort of stuff. So they have a really, really strong print future. And we've, we're seeing that not just with our brands, but with brands and owned by other people as well, the, the sort of the supplement, the magazine supplements are a really strong part of it. In terms of the wider magazine magazine industry, I mean, I don't have any responsibility for magazines in DC Thompson, but magazines are, are kind of in the space that we're in anyway, in the sense that they normally have, they tend to be audience specific or they're very much more honed towards um, uh, 
you know, subject areas or demographics and that sort of stuff in a way that newspapers weren't. Um, but the digital future for magazines is a really interesting debate. I don't really know which way it's going to go. I think it'll go a different way to news brands. I think news brands still have the immediacy of day-to-day -day news and day-to-day -day coverage, which gives them a different position in the market. I think magazines have to find a way to engage with their audiences in the same way as we are trying to engage with audiences, but in such a way that there'll be a much more competitive environment in the sense that um, they're not going to be able to rely on geography the way that we are. They're going to have to just simply, you know, if, if you're my weekly, you're going to have to go up toe to toe with take a break in a digital sense and that sort of thing. And, you know, there, there are all kinds of battles there, but that's a whole different um, part of our company and part of our operation that I'm, um, I'm very thankful that I don't have any, any, any responsibility for. No, that's great. Thank you. I'm not sure if anyone has any other questions, but I just had one more and it was around, I know that you're saying that, you know, digital is kind of a digital first approach and print is done later. Does that impact time um, deadlines? Um, not really. Um, the, the, the deadlines for the print product are the same as, as they've always been. But if you're looking to, again, um, uh, obviously embargoed, press releases are embargoed and that and you know as always we will work with those embargoes in the way that everybody else does but non-embargoed stuff you really um you should be looking because any we will use it digitally as well as in print if if we think it um, appeals to a specific audience and really you should be looking to get it as early as you possibly can and not to worry too much about print because we will make sure that um if it's worth it it'll get into print in due course you should really be thinking about when's the um how do we optimize this for a digital audience yeah. um, and therefore the, think about the time you know um there are you know, you, you know i'm sure your own data teams will tell you when most consumption of digital products is you know peaks and troughs peaks at breakfast lunch and dinner and troughs at middle of the night unless you happen to have an american audience which your when your peak is going to be about midnight you know so the you yeah, need to start thinking about digital audiences, activity and, and patterns as well as print. But it, it, if, if whatever print deadlines you are aware of are, are exactly the same as it's been. Great. And um, sorry, just when you were speaking there around optimising the press release, will you take film content from us, yeah. share on, on the platforms? And are you, yeah, that's quite happy to take that. Yeah, I mean, um, The, the, the key is letting us know it's available. Okay. Um, and the other key is making sure it is editable from our point of view or that you can provide it. So what we don't want is 45 minutes of the best, you know, analytical documentary on, on, a, on, on something. What we want is something that is, uh, that can be optimized for social so that we can, you know, we can split it into five, 10, 15, 30 second social clips if necessary, but also that we can um, use it uh, on our website and again um in terms of um sort of viewability of the video you know, it, it, it could be a little bit of trial and error from both your side and our side in terms of what is the optimal length of video for maximum viewability and that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but that's something that will um chop and change over time and as we do it more we'll get better at it and as you do it more you'll get better at it but to know that there is that there is video footage or even audio available is absolutely vital now, I think, um, in the way that knowing whether there's a picture or not before was vital, knowing yeah. whether there's audio or not now, I, I would argue, is vital. We don't, you don't necessarily have to have video with every story, um, but you have to think audio visually about every story in a way you perhaps hadn't before. So you have to think, well, does this story suit video? Is there an obvious way we can get a piece of video on this? Um, and there might not be. You have to be prepared. So don't, you know, you don't want to sort of wait, say waste your time getting video with everything. But, you know, I'm thinking back to, to back to Jamie and his organization. You know, I can't, there are fewer organizations that are going to have a better video capability than the fire and rescue service. But there'll be some, um, you know, I think particularly some academic institutions really don't lend themselves to video particularly. But even if there isn't video capability or video available, it's still good to have some sort of visual um, hook with 
um, in it with any story. Because if you think about social media, when you're scrolling through Twitter or Facebook or whatever, it's always the stuff with the image that you start that you catches your eye. So imagery has always been important in print, but it's even more important now. So it's good to have an image, video or still with um, content. Great. Thank you so much for that. I don't know if anyone else has any final questions. I'm conscious it's nearly half one and we've taken up everyone's lunchtime already. Richard, you mentioned that you would share um, the little contact um, details donut with Hannah. Yeah. If you, would, if you would do that, that would be great because then we can yeah. send it around to people afterwards. That's I'll okay. That. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, doke Well, thank you so much again, Richard. I think everyone will agree that was a really useful session. And um, yeah, thanks for your time. Okay, great. Yeah.